recent occasion of uh, uh, great intellectual rigor, but when I was asked to make a contribution to uh, this uh, panel on the future of democracy, I thought of the uh, gloomy early winter evenings under uh, the clouds in Central Europe, and uh, therefore I thought that the time of the year was also quite appropriate with regard to a consideration of the future of uh, democracy. And in fact, uh, what I am going to say in the next few minutes uh, have very little to do with uh, the future of it. I thought I would leave that to the roundtable uh, session because it's a matter of exploration whether we should add or subtract from uh, the gloom by having a debate and learning from one another. But rather I'll take, in fact, not even a political scientist's uh, perspective but more of a historian's perspective to uh, share with you some of my thoughts as to how uh, we have come to this state of affairs. So I begin with um, the, uh, a quote from Plato's Republic. Uh, there, is a sh there is a ship owner, larger and stronger than everyone on the ship, but somewhat deaf and rather short-sighted with a knowledge of sailing to match his insight. The sailors are quarreling among themselves over the captaincy of the ship, each one thinking that he ought to be the captain, though he has never learned that skill. On top of which, they say it can't be taught. In fact, they're prepared to cut to pieces anyone who says it can. They beg him, the ship owner, that is, and to, to it, do anything they can to make him hand over the tiller to them. Sometimes, if other people can persuade him and they can't, they kill all the others and throw them overboard. Then they immobilize their worthy ship owner with drugs and drinks or by some other means and take control of the ship, helping themselves to what it is carrying, drinking and feasting. They sail the way you expect people like that to sail. Now this passage from the Republic conveys vividly one of Plato's most venomous attacks on democracy. Plato sees in democracy the makings of chaos. He perceived it as a form of rule that set the, poli that set the polity in an inevitable path of disintegration leading to anarchy. Plato's cynical view was informed to a significant degree by a fear of mediocrity overtaking the apparatus of rule and crowding out values. A prominent classicist, John Ferrari, has identified no less than 10 categories of criticism Plato levels in this passage at democracy. But essentially, I should like to point uh, two others that I find relevant to the question raised for this session. One, the lack of recognition of political expertise goes hand in hand with the opposition to recognition of intellectual superiority as an asset for leadership. Two, overriding emphasis on participation at the expense of hierarchy and institutions makes for a rudderless vessel. Um, that rings a bell, doesn't it? What Plato saw as an imminent danger for, the, uh, for Athenian freedoms, and it turned out that he was right, and the vivid picture he gave of the consequence of unrestrained rule by the people, um, and we've 
heard the consequences of this from uh, Klaus Offer right now. Uh, rule by the people, not even by the representatives of the people. They're, so, they're not so different from what we are facing today in an increasing number of countries, states, and regions. This reversal, this departure from the rules-based international order that brought on continuous improvement to my generation's quality of life has been a disorienting experience for me and for most of us. What went wrong? Why would the very country that championed the liberal order abandon its self-appointed mission and suddenly adopt a protectionist stance? And in doing so, begin to show not merely disregard, but even contempt of the very values that the liberal order was supposed to embrace and universally promote. In other words, how did the political environment in some of the leading Western countries resemble the dynamics of Plato's ship of state? I do not wish to ignore the far-reaching geopolitical changes of our time and the corresponding changes uh, in threat perceptions that form the background of the current political changes we have been witnessing. Let me say now a few words on the global challenges that profoundly affected the perceptions of self-interest or national interest in large parts of the world. The most important change is the, and Sean uh, emphasized this this morning, is the gradual but steadily accelerating movement of the world's economic center of gravity. The rise of China, though expected, has nevertheless set in motion a surprising set of transformations in terms of competition for resources and changing patterns of global trade and investment. China's total primary energy consumption, for example, surpassed that of the United States nearly nine years ago. With its planned economy, but an economic regime open to capitalism, China has emerged as a major power in a very short span of time. Two characteristics, apart from the rise of its economy, are worth noting. One, it is emerging as a major energy producer in the world because of its centrally planned and well-implemented economic growth objectives. Number two, because it has raised its GDP per capita to similar levels as that of the developed world, its consumption patterns are resembling those of OECD countries. These two factors, among others, serve to reinforce China's trajectory of economic growth. The Trump administration has responded to China's phenomenal growth by raising strategic trade barriers with a view to putting an end to China's deriving economic benefits at the expense of increasing U.S. trade benefits, at the increasing U.S. trade deficits. The rude and abrupt way the U.S. international economic policy is pursued has attracted a great deal of attention as has Trump's policy of America first, which has been viewed as part of the new trend to draw popular support for nationalist policies at the expense of breaking up the liberal order. Equally, if not more important, are developments that do not immediately catch attention. There are, for example, a series of paradoxes that accompany such major global shifts as we are witnessing today. It may be asked whether the Trump administration may be weakening America's global leverage by increasingly isolating the United States from its longtime allies and trade partners as a result of its unilateral actions. 
with China's GDP surpassing that of the U.S., foreseen in the near future, not so far away. America's economic power is bound to diminish relatively. Is the, Trump's, the Trump administration's confrontational approach to economic competitors, it may be asked, maintained because of Washington's reliance on its military power? If so, would the new containment policy bring the world perilously close to the ge geopolitical background preceding the two world wars? China's rise bodes equally immediate challenges and possibly opportunities for Europe. Beijing appears to be interested in promoting some of the key objectives originally adopted by the Western Alliance. One is the Paris Accords, which is not surprising because of the costs and damages associated with China's pollution levels. The second is China's interest in promoting trade liberalization, again not surprising since Beijing has been the main beneficiary of World Trade Organization rules. The Belt and Road Initiative, again, uh, Sean uh, emphasized earlier uh, this morning, is a gigantic project that will expand dramatically China's arena of economic activity, and it is designed to reach the European market spanning practically the entire area of Eurasia. Whether this will be taken by Europe as an exercise in adversarial economic competition or as an opportunity for the world's largest trading bloc remains to be seen. In promoting trade liberalization, however, China has in no way supported what had been considered to be the key values that sustained and uh, sustained the, the liberal order. These were essentially democratic values and the rule of law considered to be essential for that. Given the hints of creeping authoritarianism in unlikely quarters, one is tempted to ask whether there's a spreading doubt about the effectiveness of democratic values for achieving political stability today? Or is the West developing an amnesia about how it reached an understanding of democratic values as a result of an extended search over centuries? With these questions, let me now turn to the question I posed early on. What went wrong? We have in the West, and particularly in Europe, emphasized participation at the expense of institutions. We have chosen to follow relativism as a fashionable postmodern way of uncritically accepting any arguments without bothering to look and see if they had any merit. Simply accepted propositions and arguments because they were fashionable. Instead of reassessing and reaffirming common values. This has been going on for some decades now, not very many, but. It is the institutions that are the repository of values and values are modified and transmitted from one generation to the next by means of institutions. We have substituted a technical term, which is essentially a form of rule. We have substituted that term, democracy, for freedom, which is a key value that refers to human autonomy and dignity. And we have forgotten the essential role of institutions to protect freedom by, in Kant's formulation, to prevent hindrances to freedom. 
Individual liberties are also protected by in, uh, institutions, which are given the authority by society to enforce contracts, contracts ranging from petty commercial ones to all-encompassing social contract from which the concept of social contract from which our modern democracy evolved. It is, as Burke passionately argues, societal institutions that provide the foundations for political institutions, educational institutions, and others of instrumental importance. Society, said Burke, is indeed a contract and talk about subordinates, also the main contracts. It is to be looked on with reverence because it is not a partnership in things subservient only to the gross animal existence, excuse me, existence of a temporary and perishable nature. It is a partnership in all science, it's a partnership in all art, partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. As the ends of such a partnership cannot be obtained in many generations, it becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living and those who are dead and those who are to be born. Each contract of each particular state is but a clause in the general primeval contract of eternal society, linking the lower with, the, with higher natures, connecting the visible and the invisible world according to a fixed compact sanctioned by inviolable oath which holds all physical and all moral natures each in their appointed place. This is the ending paragraph or the penultimate paragraph of his um, uh, address um, on the uh, reflections on the revolutions, the revolution in France. I chose to bring up Burke in this context not merely because of his impassioned eloquence in conveying the crucial importance of social life in uh, the, the shaping of human experience, but the more so because of his profoundly informed and sensitive way in which he was able to hold up a mirror to the organization of society, which was a particular strength of the 18th century observers of people and manners. His considerations thus provide, I would argue, an effective prism through which one would be able to spot and identify what we are lacking today in terms of providing the space for freedom in our societies and political communities. It is true that in our post-industrial society, uh, it's true that our, uh, our post-industrial society is far more complex than the European society of pre-industrial revolution era, which admitted of very limited participation of the political community. But given Burke's clarity of vision, his perspective uh, is, provides a helpful means for us to see the bigger picture of how a political milieu ought to function and whether we can identify some of the misconceptions that detract from our own ability to imagine how the concept of social compact might translate into a functioning relationship of exchange between institutions and people. I have in mind not only the increased visibility of authoritarian tendencies in this continent and beyond, but also the opposite I have in mind, namely the complaints about democratic deficit, which ironically have reinforced nationalist or even particularistic demands. 
Burke's view that institutions are not artificially made, but they grow organically over time is a case in point. Institutions, he proposes, have a life of their own, but they also respond to new demands of changing social and political environments and thus grow and mature over time. Burke has long been identified as a conservative, a word that brings to mind diametrically opposite characteristics to those of Burke, especially as a person who pointed to the importance of change. In an age of rising empiricism that put proof before belief, he would argue that it is custom, tradition, and membership in society far more than reason that gives moral quality uh, to uh, hum human nature. He did not, however, reject or refute the crucial importance of reason in the very heyday of the age of reason. Only a reasonable man, exemplified by, uh, also by some of his Augustan predecessors, like Swift or Pope or Samuel Johnson, it would clearly discern the limits of reason. In other words, where it would be appropriate to appeal to reason and where it would not be reasonable to do so. As Pope said in his essay on man, know then thyself, presume not God to scan, the proper study of mankind is man. Burke, as the political scientist Sabine reminds us, was not so much interested in celebrating the rational individual against repressive authority, but to relate the individual refinement to his or her membership of organized society. Civility, as macrosociologists discovered more than a century later, was essentially the sharing of cosmopolitan space with others and recognizing a common civic sense of belonging to the same social space with others. Membership of organized society, it would follow, would be the only way for individuals to embrace and internalize civilization. Like many of his contemporaries and predecessors, Bert focused on the contrast between the state of nature and civil society, but his interest lay in stressing the vast and unbridgeable gap between what he said, this beautiful order, this array of truth, nature on one hand, and on the other hand, this a disbanded race of deserter, deserters and vagabonds, a picture of the state of nature, which is not very different from that given by Hobbes. Here I draw attention to the word nature that is associated with the notions of both order and truth. As one of Burke's distinguished contemporaries, Sir Joshua Reynolds said in one of his discourses on art, nature is and must be the fountain, which alone, uh, which al alone is inexhaustible and from which all excellencies must originally flow. Nature for Reynolds, as well as Burke, is the source for education and improvement of human beings for enabling them to develop their faculty of discernment. This association of nature with order and proportion, that is, with aesthetic and ethical concerns, points to the way in which a moral worldview can be achieved by individuals. This kind of a moral outlook, informed by aesthetics and ethics at one and the same time, is precisely what is lacking in our contemporary societies. As a result, we are able to judge 
the workings and failures of democratic regimes, what we call democratic regimes, or of those that are supposed to be democratic, and even of those which claim to be democratic. We're able to judge them only on the basis of electoral and legal technicalities. Precisely because of such constraints, our political actors have become incapable of bringing communities to converge around common values, which you emphasized as normative values. I stop here. Um, the, what uh, can be done about this in terms of education, in terms of proposals for new perspectives, is uh, something that is something that uh, we should address collectively. Thank you.